series since the beginning of the year, and unless the Lord changes my mind, this is probably going to wrap it up. Of course, next week, be sure and be here. Lots of good stuff going on. It's our opportunity to kind of come together and have family worship. The kids are going to be involved. The teens are going to be involved. Uh, the adult worship's going to be involved. Got some surprises and things going on that you'll be excited about, as well as afterward, we're planning on doing our our annual Easter celebration together, fellowship, bring bring a dish and come prepared to uh, sit down and fellowship for a while and the egg hunt for the kids and the bounce houses and everything, so it's going to be a good day. And um, so be sure and plan to be here. Um, and then, of course, everything that Zach was telling you about, just keep your eye on the, on the emails, the newsletters, the bulletins, and the announcements and everything, because lots of stuff going on. But um, we've been looking at what if. And I do believe that 2016 is our what if year here at Family Worship Center. I think, I think we're exploring by faith the things that the Lord has in store for us. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about it. But the Lord in Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says this, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, remember it's always if and then, then... I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. And folks, I, I'm telling you, if you've watched the news at all in the last little bit, you can see that our nation, this world, is in need of a big healing from the Lord. Amen? I think we are here in this generation for such a time as this. Uh, we don't need to give up. We don't need to, to be hopeless. We need to be hopeful. And we need to allow a, an opportunity to share you know, uh, Paul says it this way, be, be quick to always give an answer to anybody that would ask you about the faith that is within you. There are people out here, because of the days that we live in, they're seeking, they're looking, they're, they're looking for something, and so many of them are looking in the wrong place when we've got the answers. And so we need to be very, very quick to share with them the, about the faith that is within us. And uh, so we've been looking at this, started this message last week, and actually got the first point kind of taken care of, and that is, what if I figure out what's really important in life? Now, there's very few things, you think about this, and the, the way sometimes when I'm counseling with people, counseling with couples, I ask them this, what is it, because we, we get sometimes so crossways about the smallest of things, what is it? That, that's so important that 50 years from now is going to make a difference. Now, there's very few things in life that you can honestly say, this is so important that 50 years from now it's going to make a difference. kind of gives you an opportunity to prioritize, prioritize things in your life. And one of the most important things for us is to realize that for myself, I'll answer for myself, 50 years from now, I'm probably not going to be here, should the Lord tarry. Amen? That would make me 100 years old. And I've, as you all know, my prayer is, I'm going to live to be 100, run out of mind, body, and money, all the same day. So at 100, I hopefully am going to be gone and celebrating in heaven. But here's the thing. There are very few things that you could put in that category, but one of the most important things is our relationship with God, and our relationship with each other. Those two things always, always, always fall into the category of things that matter. And so if we figure out the important things in life, we've, we've figured out that we need the Lord in our life and we've taken care of business, and it is so easy, folks. That's, that's one of the things that when I first came into this thing as an adult, it seemed like it was a hard thing. It seemed like people wanted to make it a hard thing. But God has made it so easy for us to be in right relationship with Him because of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it was impossible. It would never happen. We as human beings could never attain the goal of getting to God, being in heaven. But because He sent Jesus, it is easy. I always say it this way. It's as easy as ABC. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And C, confess your sin. Amen? It's that easy. If we take care of business with God, then that part of it is squared away and we are good. And we need to cultivate the relationships that we have with one another. If you look at the New Testament and you start writing down, I did this one time and I don't have it with me this morning so I won't read them all to you. But I just sat down 
and started at the beginning, and everything that the Lord said, or through the disciples said, this is what you need to do for one another. You need to love one another, exhort one another, encourage one another, lift one another up, all these things and all those different phrasings. And it was over one page of things that we were supposed to do for one another. And so none of us is, is a lone ranger of the cross. Amen? Even the lone ranger had Tonto. Amen? The Lord expects none of us to be an island in and of ourselves. We are supposed to rely on one another, love one another, encourage one another, exhort one another. All these things that we are supposed to do to help each other along the way because God knew it would never happen by ourselves. Now, whenever Peter, in the very first thing, Jesus asked him, this is a big thing in the, in the life of Jesus and his disciples, when he asked them, who... Who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some people say you're a prophet. Some people say you're an uh, incarnation of Elijah or Jeremiah and all these kinds of things. You're a prophet. You're, you're this. You're that. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, under the unction of the Holy Spirit and under revelation from the Holy Spirit, said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, some branches of our family tree said that that was saying that Peter was the rock, that the church was built on Peter. But no, it was built on the statement that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen? And so whenever we make an individual commitment to God, that's one thing. That's, that's a rock. And if you look at the phrasing where he says, upon this rock I'll build my church, gates of hell won't prevail against it. If you look at the first time he says the word rock, it means a little pebble. That's one of us saying Jesus Christ is the Son of God and I believe him as such. But whenever he says it the second time, it is the word for a huge cliff. So in other words, us as individuals, we make this, this statement, Jesus Christ is Lord, that's, a, that's a one little rock. But all of us together, every believer, not just in this church, but every church, in this day and time, we are a huge cliff of a statement that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what he said, on that rock, I'll build my church. Amen? So we don't need, to, this is a day and time where we do not need to be ashamed of the gospel. That we need to be proud of saying I'm a believer, that I know God, that, that He dwells within me. And to lift one another up. And whenever we see a, a, a fellow believer, regardless of what branch in our family tree, amen? We got a, we've got a big family tree and lots of branches in it. And yeah, we don't agree with them on everything. But whether it's these Coptic Christians that are having their heads chopped off in, in Syria, or whether it's somebody that's, that believes this way or that way, if they believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you know what? We're for them. Amen? We need to forget about the names over the door. I think there's a day coming when it's not going to matter what branch of the family tree that you are in or from or want to be in. It's going to be the fact that you are in that family tree, that you do believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is one of the most important things. So our relationship with God, our relationship with one another is so important that we need to go beyond the surface stuff. And when, you know, I've said this before, we all come into church on Sunday mornings and everybody's got a smile and, hey, how are you? Uh, you know, and everybody, oh, I'm doing fine. We need to get real. And sometimes life is tough. And we need to learn to pray for one another. Just like we did up here. Sometimes things don't go according to the way you want it to go. It's not the way you had it planned. It's not the way you thought it would be. And that's time when we need to borrow a little bit of faith. You know, used to neighbors would borrow a cup of sugar. You know, oh, I'm, I'm baking a cake and I'm out of sugar. You'd go over to the neighbor, you got milk or you got flour, sugar, whatever. And you'd loan it because you were a good neighbor. Hey, as Christian believers we need to be good neighbors and there are some times 
And if you've never been there, then praise God. But there are times, and I've been there, and probably most of you have been there, when there are things going on that the very most you can do is squeak out the name Jesus. Because you are hurting so bad, or the weight of this world is so heavy, that the only thing you can do is squeak out the name Jesus. Sometimes you don't know how to pray. Sometimes you don't feel like praying. <gasps> Did you say that, Pastor? Yes, I said that. There are sometimes you just don't feel like praying. And that's when you need to call somebody and say, I need you to pray for me. I've, I'm a firm believer in the prayer of agreement. And I've always said, I'll pray with you. But I've learned through the years that sometimes there are times when you need somebody to pray for you. Because you just can't do it. That's what this thing's about. That's why we come together on Sunday mornings. And it shouldn't be just a one-time deal. It shouldn't be just, okay, I, 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 I paid my obligation to God and so now I'm cool for the rest of the week. It ought to be that we're continually lifting one another up and thinking about each other and you get a, a church directory, and we need to update that soon, but you get a church directory and go through there. That's what I do sometimes. I, I, I look at your names, and some of you have known that I have called you out of the blue and just said, hey, I'm thinking about you, or I've sent a card, or a postcard, and just said, want you to know I was thinking about you and praying for you. Now, if you've been on the receiving end of that, you know what that feels like. Wow. God, that's pretty awesome. Because I've had so many people, call, as I've called them or I've sent them a card, and they, you didn't know what was going on this week. But I want to tell you one thing, it came just at the right time. See, God knows. And if we'll listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, then all of a sudden we can, we can be a tool in the hand of God to be used for whatever His purpose is. And that, again, has a whole lot to do with one another. Somebody say Amen. Which brings me to my second point. What if I prayed like God was really going to hear and do something about it? How many times do we not pray that way? How many times do we just go through the motions? Uh, sometimes, the fact is, I started to do it this morning, and I'm glad I didn't because then we prayed later, but I started to open this morning with, hey, we're about to pray. How many of y'all want something or need something? How many of you want in on this? That's the way we ought to look at prayer. It is a grand opportunity for us to go to our Heavenly Father and tell Him everything. It's our communication with God. It's, it's how we stay in touch with Him. And as I've said so many times, at least 50% of prayer is listening. It's not just about going to God like He was Santa Claus and giving Him our wish list. And, and when we get done with our wish list that we say, in Jesus' name, Amen. After we get through talking, you know what? We, we ought to allow God an opportunity to talk to us. Because you know what? I'll guarantee you there's some things He's wanting from us. I want you to go talk to this person. I want you to stop by and visit with this person. I want you to take this person some, some food. Or I want you to, I want you to do something uh, that, that sometimes we don't even think about. I've shared with you, uh, at least, I don't know, if, I may not have ever show, shared it on a Sunday morning. But there was one time, this was very, very early in my Christian walk. And there was, a, there was a family who had left the church that we were attending, kind of in a huff. and got their feathers ruffled about something. And so they had they'd been out of church for two or three Sundays. And I didn't know what the situation was. This was way before I was called to preach or anything. I was just a member of the church. And I'll never forget, I had stuff to do. I was, I was building a house, our house that we were going to live in. And so I was working, working at Briggs and Stratton. I was building this house. So I had a busy, busy time. So I'd gone into town, pick up some, some lumber and stuff to work on the house, some things that I needed. And so I'm coming back home. I'm just buzzing down the highway. And I was passing by the road where these people lived. And the Lord said... I want you to turn in there and stop by and visit them. I just kept driving. Why? Because I didn't want to. 
Amen? And I'll never forget this. I, I could take you to the very spot in the road where I felt like if I drove one foot further, I'd make God mad. I put on my blinker, I turned around and I drove real slow back to the road, hoping that God would say, okay, good enough. <laughs> so I turned in the road and I'm driving even slower. I mean, I'm just creeping down through there. So I go to their house. I'm, I'm just, at this point, I'm just thinking, let them not be home. Let them not be home. So it looks like they're home. So I stop and I get out and I walk very, very slowly up to their house, still hoping that God would re- relent and give me a break. So I knock on the door, ring the doorbell, nobody's home. And so I'm like, okay. I ring the doorbell again. And I start back to my truck. And I'm like, God, what, what's up with this? I know I had to stop here to talk to these people. And I didn't want to, but I did. And now they're not home. And you knew that to begin with. And it was just like the Lord said to me, yes, I just wanted to see if you would. And I'm like, I mean, I just melted. Because I came that close to blowing it with God. Not, you know, I think he would have forgiven me, and I think I could have repented for that, and, got, you know, it all would have been right. But I'm telling you, sometimes God just wants to see if we will. You know, everybody you witness to is not going to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord. But sometimes we need to do it just because God wants to see if we will. Sometimes we need to talk about that good news in a situation that doesn't dictate it just so, because he wants to see if we will. How important is it to us? Because see, here's the thing. You don't hesitate to talk about something that you know is good. I've said this many, many times. If you go eat the best steak you've had in 20 years, you go to work and you talk about it, you'll talk to, to the lady in the checkout line. I'm telling you, I had the best steak I've eaten in years. Somebody bring up something about a meal. I'll tell you what, I had the best steak I've had in 20 years at this place. But yet we're hesitant. To tell people about the bread of life. And so what we need to do is realize that what, we are, what we've got is so important. What we've got is so life changing to people. That we don't need to be hesitant about talking about it. Like somebody said one time, not even sure who they give credit to saying it. But the guy said this, I'm, I'm a beggar telling another beggar where to get a piece of bread. And that's the way we need to approach everybody in our life. I'm just a beggar. I'm just a sinner saved by grace telling somebody else where to find that grace. Amen? So we need to, we need to pray like, like God was going to hear and He was going to do something about it. That, that if, we, um, if we realize the power of our words, realize what weight they carry. The, the Word tells us this, Proverbs 18. It says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And we let this, this thing right here get us in so much trouble. Amen? It gets us in so much trouble because we, sometimes we're a loose cannon with this thing right here. A little thing causes great damage. Sets the world on fire is what James says it does. And sometimes we are so loose with our words. If we felt like God was listening and felt like that God, our weight had... Our, our words had weight with God, would we ever say, oh, my back is killing me? Amen? Oh, my knee, it's killing me. Do your words have power? Proverbs 18 says there's life and death in the power of the tongue. We're speaking death. We start speaking death almost from the time we can speak. It's killing me. Somebody tells a joke, you're killing me. And just to show you, and I've done this before, but just to show you how odd it is, what if I said, my back is bringing me to life? It sounds stupid, doesn't it? Because we're so used to speaking death. Now, I'm not saying deny the things that are going on. Some of us have back. That's what Randy came up to pray about. Sometimes their back hurts. Sometimes their knees hurt. And I'm not saying don't talk about it or don't deny it, but you just, I mean, here's the thing. If there is power in our words, 
then what we need to do is go to God and tell him, God, my knee's hurt. And I would really, really, really like it if it would quit. I know you didn't create this knee to hurt. Amen? Find somebody to agree with you because there is power in the prayer of agreement. And you know what? If we start acting like our words have power, our words carry weight, and if we start speaking that way, see, God has to ignore so much about what we say because our back is killing us or my knee's killing me or you're killing me with that joke or all these kinds of things. God has to ignore so much of what we say. He's not sure when we're serious and when we're not. So what if we act like our words mattered? What if we act like our prayers matter? What if we act like God's hearing everything that we pray and he's going to do something about it? You know what? A lot of times it does. If we, I mean, we have so many different ways. Have you ever heard somebody end or start a statement with bless their hearts? God love them. All that kind of stuff. <laughs> But our words matter. Amen? And we, we underestimate the power of prayer. The Word tells us that the, righteous, the prayer of a righteous person avails much with God. In other words, it makes a difference. So if we start acting like our prayers matter, and we start praying prayers, see, so, so many times we wait to pray till the foreclosure is already happening. We wait to pray until the divorce papers are ready to sign. We, we, we don't pray until the pink slip comes at work. I believe in preventative prayer. Amen? I don't believe in just praying when you get sick. I believe in praying about health and wellness. God, show me the things that I need to do to prevent that. Show me what I need to eat. Show me what I don't need to eat. Show me to stay away from buffets. Amen? We've had that talk before. That's my weak spot. And what I'm telling you is, if we begin to pray like God's hearing, it, and He is, then we'll start praying prayers that really, really matter. Amen? And this is number three. What if I love like the Lord says to love? Of all the things that is so important to God, it's in John chapter 13. He said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love, one for another. It's our love that makes a difference. Now, I've, I've talked about what a difference that made in the early church, that it was their love that changed the world. And, and so many times we, we don't live that out. We, we, don't, we don't love with no reserve. We don't love. Paul says it this way. He says, I can talk all the spiritual things that there are in life. I can, I can prophesy. I can, uh, I can uh, speak in tongues. I can give prophecies. I can have revelation from God. I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And if I don't have love... I didn't, couldn't find a stick, so I'm just having... It doesn't sound very good, does it? I'm really important. I'm doing all the right things. I'm, I'm righteous to, in front of God because I'm doing the right things. I'm saying the right words. And Paul says, you're just that right there. Now, there were some reasons that Paul said that in the day and time in which he lived, and especially when he was at Corinth, he saw a lot of these false gods worshipped. And what they would do is some, they'd just pick a day of the week and it was going to be a special day under their God. And they'd all get their pots and pans and lids and everything. And they'd come out and they'd just be banging them together. Have a parade going down the street, bringing attention to their God. That false God that they worshipped. And Paul looked out there and said, you know, if I don't have love, which is the most important thing to God, then I'm nothing but a sounding brass and a tinkling symbol. Amen? And he said it's the, it's the dividing factor, the, the most important thing that we can do is to love one another and, and allow God to love through us and allow God to do something with our love. See, faith is important, but it's our, it's our activator. It's the thing that activates what we believe about God. 
Hope is our elevator. Hope is what gets our sights out of this world. Because if we're looking at this world, if you're watching the news 24-7, you're going to be depressed. Amen? We, our hope is, and the Bible talks about it this way, it said, Jesus Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's us saying, this is not all there is. Because Jesus lives in me, I know there's something out of this world waiting on me. Hope is our elevator. But love is our motivator. Everything that we do as a born-again believer ought to be because we love, because we know how God loved us, and therefore we're going to love other people. It's so easy to discount other people. We, we, it's easy to love people that look like us, act like us, smell like us. I'll never forget this one time. My dad had... Uh, been feeling bad. He had a lot of upset stomach and everything. And he went to the doctor, and the doctor prescribed him, uh, I think it was Pepsid, okay? Took care of his stomach problems. And the doctor said, before I write you a long-term prescription for this, let's just eliminate that there's anything else. So he goes in for a test. It's a arteriogram. And my mom calls me. It's just a routine test. She tells me, said, we're, we're, he's fixing to have this test. So I, I headed that way. By the time I got there, the doctor was in there, had my mom in the room, said he's got three blockages, severe ones, like 80% blocked. And we're going to have to do heart surgery. So the next morning at 5.30 a.m., they were cutting him open, getting ready to do bypass surgery. And I'll never forget, the surgery gets over with, he does fine through the surgery, and we go in, this is the very first time we get to see him after the surgery, so he's not up to par, you know, he's... A, Things are still, you know, pretty serious. And so we come back out. We had had our little corner. You know how if you're in ICU or CCU or surgery waiting room, you get your little area. That's your area. And that's where your family is. Well, when I come back out, here's this biker dude. Big guy. About my size. And uh, he sat in my chair. I had me a nice, comfortable chair over there in the corner, and here is this guy, and he's a big guy, it's summertime, and he's wearing nothing but jeans and a leather vest. Just run with that for a minute. It smells like you'd been chopping onions in that place. And you know, just for a split second, I'm like, well, Stinky Pete, you got my seat. You know, I didn't say it out loud because I didn't want to fight in the, in the waiting room. But I'm like, didn't come in, he got my chair. That, I had that chair, that was my chair. And I, I'm, boy, I'm just mulling this over. Our little area is busted up, so we're all sitting all over the place now. And I'm just, you know, here's Stinky Pete, he got my chair. And the Lord stopped me and he said, you know, what you need to do is love that guy. And because you don't know what he's been through today. And come to find out, it was a close friend of his that had been in a motorcycle wreck. And here he comes right up there to, to see about his friend. And see, that's the way it is in life. What we worry about is somebody getting our seat instead of thinking about that person, what they've been through, what they're... I, I, there was another time, and I, I hadn't even thought about this one in years. I, I went to the hardware store, was got, looking for certain kind of screws, and I couldn't find it in the hardware store. No, they had it. And uh, so I see a guy that works there. And uh, where's the, where's, uh, here it is. So I'm going to use Wayne for a minute. Wayne, come up here. So I said, hey, I'm looking for this certain kind of screw. Um, and I know you got them, but I can't find them. So, you know, I'm asking him, Wayne's going to be me for a minute. That guy, he just like, <sighs> never says a word. Walks over down the shelf there. It's on the bottom shelf. He grabs this box of screws and walks away. I'm like, hey, you ever had a finger stuck in your eye? <laughs> and again, it's one of those times whenever the Lord said, you don't know what this guy has been through. You're right, Lord. I'm just going to pray for him instead of sticking my finger in his eye. <laughs> but see, what happens is, we, we get in traffic, and we get so put out with people. Somebody's cutting in front of us. Hey, maybe they're 10 minutes late for work. And I'm, I'm probably not the one to be preaching on having patience in traffic. My wife will tell you that. 
probably get an amen right there. <laughs> but sometimes we need to stop and think about what somebody's going through. Think about what's going on. You know, I, don't, I didn't ask that guy, I didn't talk to him, but I prayed for him on the way out. First off, I said, Lord, thank you for letting me not stick my finger in his eye when he did that. But secondly, God, touch him, because I don't know what he's been through today. Maybe, maybe the boss just got through chewing on him. I don't know. Give Wayne a hand clap for helping me. Because Wayne would probably stick his finger in my eye if I did that, for real. But this, sum it all up. If we don't have love, that's all we are out in this world talking about the Lord. And I'm just going to read you. Because it, it, it is so, much, so good that I can't improve on it. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I, don't, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. Now, again, let me stop right here and give a little sidebar. I think all those things are supposed to happen in the church, or Paul wouldn't be talking about them. I think the church is, is, has a gift of tongues and prophecy and knowledge and understanding and wisdom and gifts of healing and gifts of, of all kinds of things, amen, that can go on in the church. Or Paul wouldn't be talking about it, but what he's saying is if love is not our motivation, then we are nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. Whew, boy, do we. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages or tongues and special knowledge will uh, become useless one day. But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is in part and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy re reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, when we see the Lord, then these things that are partial will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought as, and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. And now we see imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything in perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, you, you give us three things there. Faith, hope, and love. Why, why, what's the difference? Why is one more important than the others? And this is what the answer the Lord gave me. And he said, one day your faith will be completed. Because we're believing and things that we cannot see that they are real. Amen? One day we'll get to see heaven. One day we'll be face to face with Jesus. Angie asked me one time, she said, what will you do when you stand before him? And I, I just answered that quick and I said, I'm going to give him a big bear hug. <laughs> then I said, no, wait a minute. Maybe I'll fall down at his feet. I don't know what I'll do. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm going to tell him thank you for loving me. Amen? So he says faith is one day going to be revealed. Second thing, what is hope? I told you earlier, it's our elevator. It's the thing that gets our eyes off of this world and being hopeless. Because if you looked at this world all the time and there was nothing beyond that, we would be hopeless. And one day, our elevator is going to go all the way to the top. Amen? And we're going to get to see what we have hoped for all that time. So that leaves one thing. It's going to be eternal and everlasting. And that is love. Because see, that's what God is. Beloved, let's love one another. For God is of love and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God. 
For God is love. Amen? What if we realized what was the most important thing in life and we built everything else on it? Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, thank you for all the things that you have spoken to us, spoken to me about what if. And, and Lord, I, as far as I know, I guess we're done with that. But you may have other plans. We're going to listen for your voice. But Lord, I thank you for, for speaking to us about what if. And what if we decide to follow you completely, wholeheartedly. And I think, Lord, that's what you want. I think you're wanting us to, to leave everything else behind, to follow you with no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. And I thank you, Lord for loving us first. It wasn't because we loved you that you came down here and did all these things. It was because you loved us first. I thank you for that. Lord, if there's one person here that maybe, maybe there's something between you and them, maybe there's something that would, that, that would cause them to be hesitant about a relationship with you, Lord, I pray that today you would make yourself very, very real to them. And Lord, we might, just, we might even just pray this. Lord, I, I ask you that you would come into my heart and into my life. I ask you that you would save me. That you would forgive all those sins that I've done. And they are many. And God, that you would come into my heart and into my life. That you would become real to me. Lord, that you would lead me and guide me and direct me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, if we pray that prayer, then we've, we've done away with those things. We have come into right relationship with you, and I thank you for that possibility. But Lord, you don't want us to stop there. You want us to go above and beyond that. You want us to become a disciple. And Lord, that is a process. It's that we give our hearts and our minds and our bodies over to you and allow you to work in us and do things that we are incapable of doing by ourselves. And so, Lord, we as the church, I do believe this is our what if year. So, Lord, we're continuing to ask, what if you do some awesome things? What if you come in and meet us where we're at and take us above and beyond anything that we could even think or ask for? And that's what your word says. So, Lord, today, we just give ourselves to you. We thank you for already meeting us here. Thank you for the fact that we took time out and, and prayed with each other. And Lord, I think that's what we're supposed to do. So Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory for the great things that you've got in store for us. And we give you thanks for it all. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Joel, lead us in a little course. <laughs> with